So today we're talking about the Basel framework or Basel III regulation, which is the central legis legislation that tells banks how to do their risk management, right? And what have we learned so far? So, so far we've said that risk management is all about balancing risk and equity. And we have seen that risk is comprised of different, let's say, risk types, credit risk, market risk, and so on and so forth. If you haven't heard those terms, look at my earlier videos. And Basel basically tells banks how to calculate values for this risk. And here's the central idea behind it. Let's say we have a certain bank and this bank is at the beginning of financial year 2022, right? So it's January 2022. And we are thinking about the earnings or losses that the bank will make in the, the following year 2022. Right? And we can think about probabilities. Right? Let's just say that the probability that this bank will make um, an earning between 0 and 100 million euros is 50%. Right? And we can calculate probabilities that this bank also will make a loss. Right? Maybe the, the probability that this bank will make a loss between minus 100 million dollars and 0 is also about 50%. And what the Basel Accord or Basel Regulation tells banks is banks need to, to derive their losses on a 99.9% .9 worst case. 99.9%. Right? So they need to calculate a loss that will not happen in 99.9% .9 of the cases. Right? In other words, what Basel does is, is it wants banks to survive every year on a 99.9% .9 probability. So how do we calculate this 99.9% .9 value? As we've already seen, risk, the risk for most banks is derived from different risk factors, right? Credit risk, market risk, and so, far, so on and so forth. And Basel, the Basel Accord basically says that this risk needs to be calculated with two different approaches. And those different approaches are called the pillar one approach which is also called a regulatory approach and the pillar two approach, which is also called an economic approach. And I will go into this later, why Basel requires banks to use two approaches. But because first, let's, let's try to understand why, what those approaches are. So the pillar one is a regulatory approach to calculating risk at a 99.9% .9 worst case. And pillar one can be really simple. Let's look at this bank. And in the, in the example, the bank has four different financial products. The bank has a German sovereign loan, a, a sovereign loan to the country of Cameroon, which is in Africa, a short-term loan to a German bank, Deutsche Bank, and a residential mortgage. Right? And those are all the credits that this bank has given. Right? So this, those are all values which are relevant to credit risk. And this bank also has a share in Apple. Right? And this is relevant to market risk. And what Basel does is it assigns weights to every single position in the credit book of a bank. And this weight represents the probability that the counterparty will default or not pay back money. Right? So it's very dependent um, on whether the counterparty is financially stable or not. And so for the German sovereign loan, Germany is a very stable country and a stable government. So the risk weight is really low. Cameroon is not so stable, so the risk rate might be 0 0.5. A short-term loan to Deutsche Bank is rather stable as it is short-term, so the risk rate might be 0 0.1. And a residential mortgage is also rather stable, so the risk rate might be 0 0.1. And all that happens within Pillar 1 approach is that the value of the credit is multiplied, multiplied with this risk weight. And there are big tables which are um, given out by the banking authorities, and those tables basically give those risk weights. So the bank doesn't have to do anything right? rather than multiplying the risk weight and the value of the credit. Right? In our case, this would be mm, the sum would be 51.1. Right? And there's also a very standardized approach to market risk. Right? And all that happens in the end is that um, the bank takes the risk-weighted assets from credit risk, the risk-weighted assets from market risk, the risk-weighted assets from operational risk, 
and from liquidity risk. And all those risk-weighted assets are summed up, right? And this sum gives you the risk weight, risk value for pillar one. And what you do in the end is you compare your equity to this risk, which is was obtained with the pillar one approach. And typically, and this is a very famous number, equity times 8% needs to be larger than the obtained risk value, right? This is just, this 8% is just a number that comes from the regulation. In some years, the regulator might increase this number. In some years, the regulator might decrease this number. But this 8% is a very typical number that banks need to achieve. So this is pillar one approach. Pillar two approach, the so-called economic approach, um, is a bank internal approach, which means that we have the same financial positions here that I showed you within the pillar one approach. But within pillar two, the bank is very free in how to obtain this 99.9% .9 worst case. And the bank will build internal models, so the bank will hire people who are very smart and they will just calculate what is the loss stemming from the financial product on a 99.9% .9 worst case. And this is called economic capital or ECAP, right? And the banking people, they will just calculate numbers here, right? I'm just making up numbers now. And those numbers are the ECAP for the different financial positions that the bank is having. And what you then do in pillar two is you also add the risk positions, right? So you take your credit risk and you take your market risk and so on and so on. And those added give you your risk measured by pillar two. The special thing in pillar two is that you can have a, a lot of risk types that go into this pillar two figure, right? In pillar one, we had market risk, credit risk, operational risk, and liquidity risk. And those are the four risk types which make up the pillar one risk um, figure. In pillar two, you're very free to choose your own risk types. So your pillar two risk figure can consist of 10 to 12 or even more risk types, right? So you're more flexible there. And this is also the answer why there is pillar one and pillar two. Pillar one is a very unflexible approach which means that pillar one allows the banking authority to compare banks very easily, right? However, pillar two is a very flexible approach that banks can adapt to their own business model, right? This means pillar two can be, in some cases, a better measurement of the real risk at a bank, right? because pillar two is tailored towards the individual business model of a bank, while pillar two is more general. And in the following videos, we're going to go deeper into how those risk figures are obtained for the different risk types. So we're going to look deeper into credit risk, market risk, operational risk, and so on.